Good evening, everyone. This is James Oldfield coming to you from uh, Maya Dan. This is a Word from the Lord radio program. This is a new program that we're doing starting on Sunday afternoons at 5 p.m., and it's going to be a live calling program. We'll be discussing the Bible, and if you have a Bible question, then we'll be glad to uh, answer that question and have some dialogue and discuss the differences that we may be having. There's a lot of differences going on in religion. If you just look around, there's a lot of uh, different beliefs, uh, not only just outside of Christianity, but even within so-called Christianity. And so we're trying to find out why it is that we're all different. We all claim to follow the Bible, but yet we are seemingly different when it comes to what we believe, what we practice, and what we preach and teach. And so this uh, program is designed to open up the um, uh, lines of dialogue, the lines of communi communication, and let's discuss why we're different and see if we can find the unity that Jesus prayed for in John 17. And so we are trying to do that very thing, and we hope that you'll find this program interesting and enlight enlightening, and we hope that you will uh, join us in the uh, dialogue. Uh, this is brought to you by the Eden Church of Christ. We meet at 250 The Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina. And we have service times at 9 a.m. for Bible study on Sundays and 10 a.m. for worship. And then we meet on Thursdays at 7 p.m. for Bible study. And you can also watch a Word from the Lord television program that comes on Thursday nights at 9 p.m. on WGSR, Star News, uh, out of regional. So I believe that's Channel 5 if you're on cable. Uh, I think it's Channel 47 or something on the air, on the, like the rabbit ears. And so we hope that you will uh, watch those programs as well and see if we can, uh, again, have some dialogue join the, and join the discussion about what the Bible is saying about uh, what God would have us to do. I want you to think for a moment about rules. I know growing up we probably didn't like rules, but why do we have rules? What are, what are the purpose of rules? Someone said rules are made to be broken, and someone else replied, well, so are noses. So uh, I don't know if that's really how we want to look at that. Rules are not necessarily made to be broken. The Bible says that law is not for the righteous man, but for the unrighteous. And so individuals who are outside of the law are then restrained by law. And now, if you were thinking, where would we be without any kind of laws? No traffic laws, uh, no kind of uh, criminal justice system, no, no right or wrong in society. Where's the moral standard that we're going to be using? And when you look at the world around about us, when you look at what's going on in the world today, you have uh, different groups rioting in the streets. They're burning buildings. They're throwing uh, uh, Molotov cocktails and you know, all tell, no telling what all kinds of things are going on. They're burning flags and burning uh, uh, people in effigy uh, at the very least. And these are really, if you want to say, if you want to look at it this way, these are pretty good examples of what social uh, society would be like if we were to experiment with anarchy, with no rules. And sadly, that's where, what we, where we are. Even though we have rules in this country, it seems like more and more people are simply going outside the law, above the law, not paying any attention to the law, and the law itself seems to be letting so many people go, uh, you know, go as they want to and have their free-for-all. And so we're trying to figure out why it is that societies like that and if you're wondering what is making all these people, you know, go tear down statues, burn flags, and, and riot in the streets, well, maybe, maybe it's because religion is not doing its part. You know, you stop and think about it. The things that happen in the church buildings, the things that happen in the pew, will eventually get to the public. There's a saying that says, as the pulpit goes, so goes the pew. And I would say, as the pew goes, so goes the public. Because the people in the churches are going to dictate what happens in society by influence, by teaching, by, by training their children or being an influence in the community. And so when that goes by the wayside, then you see the public society go by the wayside as well. And so I submit to you that getting back to the Bible is what really is going to solve all this. Now, you say, well, why would we not want our government? Or why would government uh, uh, be beneficial? Well, think about it this way. Uh, People need to be restrained as long as it's within a, a moral guideline or a, shall we say, a, an, uh, an objective guidelines. In other words, we don't want 
government to rule or dictate over us, but at the same time, I mean, to be oppressive, but at the same time, we want government in our lives to regulate the evildoers. Now, listen to what Paul says. In Romans 13, verses 1 through 4, 4 the Apostle Paul said, Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So the Apostle Paul is telling us that the powers that be are ordained of God. Your, your, your senators, your policemen, your city officials, the president, the congress, those are all powers that be that are ordained of God. In other words, God allows governments to exist. Now, when that government abuses its power, it's going to be like anything else. It is going to be subject to God's judgment and God's wrath. But the powers that be should not be fought against simply because we want to fight the power. What we should do is we should look at the powers that be and say, you know what, this is going to be good for society or it's going to be bad for society. But not just to fight the power, not just oppose the powers, just because um, they exist. I was watching a video just a, a, a little bit this afternoon of a policeman that wanted a, a sample of blood from a, an, an individual that had been driving in a car and was unconscious, and they wanted to... Um, they wanted to see if he was uh, had alcohol in his system, and the the nurse would not give him the blood sample because hospital rules regulated that the, the patient had to be either under arrest, or consenting, or they had a search warrant, and the police had n n neither of those. They had uh, none of those three things, and so the the nurse was not going to draw the blood, and so the the police officer just arrested the nurse. And when you're watching this, you're saying that is just an abuse of a power. That is abuse of power, and here's this man that's just going beyond the law. Well, we don't want our police to do that, but at the same time, we want the police to protect us from the people that would break in our houses and hurt our families and, and hurt us. And so we have to have rules. Now, no one is above the law. We wouldn't say anybody's above the law uh, because that would mean that they get to do what they want to. Now, we have in this country an idea called a diplomatic immunity, and uh, oftentimes that's, I guess that is... Not oftentimes, but I guess that is regulated to individuals who are from other countries and they have, uh, they have immunity as diplomats from another country. But when that happens, they get to do whatever they want to. Now, if they commit a murder, the government does not uh, arrest them and, and convict them or prosecute them, but they may deport them. But still, that person is not held accountable for the crime that was committed. Maybe their diplomatic immunity is revoked, but still... We don't like the fact that people are mistreated and, uh, and justice is not served. Or we don't like the idea of someone being uh, cheated or cheating us. We want things to be fair. I was watching a show with uh, my, my girls the other day, and they were doing a, a, an experiment with uh, two, I can't remember what kind of monkeys they were, but um, they, were, they had two monkeys in a cage, and they would they would hand one monkey a rock, and when he handed it back, the assistant, the lab person, would hand them a, a sliced cucumber. Well, the, that was fine for the first monkey, but the second monkey got a grape. And after a while, the first monkey started to realize every time they did what was asked of them, they were given a, this nasty cucumber and not the desired grape, and so they began throwing a fit. I mean, whenever they handed the cucumber, they were throwing it back. They were throwing it out of the cage. I mean, it was... Hilarious to watch, but you started to see no one likes to be mistreated. Everyone likes to be treated equally. So how do we do that? Well, we have one set of rules. We have a standard of rules that we're all going to live by, and no one should be immune from the law. Now, Jesus said it this way in John 12, and verse 48. He said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Now, friends, you may be saying, well, I don't want to yield my life to God. I don't want to submit myself to the Bible. Well, that's fine. That's your, that's your choice. But you need to realize one day everybody's going to be held accountable to the Bible, which is God's Word. And so why not conform to the Word today? 
since everyone is going to be held accountable to it. I mean, it's like an open book test. You know, when kids are in school, they like open book tests because then they get to go and they can search for the answer and make sure they get the right answer. Well, wouldn't you want to do that before the great judgment day, the great test, when we're all going to be judged and sentenced? So why not go to the Bible now while we have time? Because once this life is over, our faith sealed. And the way we have lived according to the Bible is going to be uh, sealed in faith. Um, my daughter and I were coming to the radio station this evening, and uh, as we came by, we drove by a cemetery, and there was a there was a grave dug, and uh, I said, someone's going in, either today or tomorrow, and it's too late for them, and that's exactly right. Friends, you don't want to wait. You want to get to the Bible now, and you want to make sure that you're uh, accountable to the Bible. So let me ask you this. What would cause all the religious division in the world then? If everybody claims to be following the Bible, what would cause all of this religious division where everybody's saying one thing and doing another thing? Now, I have been told, and members of the Church of Christ have been, have been accused of causing division by simply asking questions or pointing out differences in religions. I want to play this video for you, and I want you to consider if what is being said by this uh, caller is is accurate or not now this person is going to make a statement and i want you to see if it's accurate or not here's here's what he says what you're doing is segregating you're saying yada 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 this this is my religion is the only one right that's not right when we get to heaven it's going to be all types of religion can i say go to heaven yes okay i am not segregating everybody else is already segregated you know how long i've lived in this in this area sir Four years. Now you tell me how many, how many different religions were in this area before I got here? Several. Oh, oh so I'm not the cause of segregation. In, in in fact, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring people together because I'm showing you know this person's not teaching what the Bible says and this person not teaching what the Bible says. But if you <coughs> and you and you would teach what the Bible says, guess what we'd have? We'd have unity. And you are so saying that. The reason you're in the Pentecostal Holy Church is because you don't really believe what the Baptists or the Methodists or, or the uh, Lutherans no, teach. All right, so the caller saying, you know, he, he told me earlier, he said the reason why he's not in the the uh, the Baptist or the, or the Methodist or the Pentecostal religion is because he didn't agree with what they taught. But yet he's telling me that I'm dividing by pointing out the differences. Friends, pointing out the differences is not causing the division. What's causing the division is individuals not submitting to the authority of the Bible. They're choosing to submit to their own religion, to their own authority, instead of what God set forth. Now listen to what the Apostle Paul would say. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 1, he said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer, for God, prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now stop there for a moment. There's a lot of individuals in the religious world today that would have a zeal for God. They have a zeal for God. I go down the world and I see signs all over time. Thank you, Jesus, or, or all kind of religious references, you know, uh, repent or so forth. But uh, different, um, I guess you might say, what, references or Bible references. And so I know that people have a zeal for God, but yet when you hear what they're saying or you hear what they're believing or what they're teaching, what they're practicing, you have to then go to the very next verse that Paul says, and this is what uh, we find. He says, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now, friends, what is the righteousness of God? Well, if we go back to Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to, the Jew, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Now watch it. Verse 17. Romans 1, 17. He says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. So the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. Now if someone is ignorant of God's righteousness, that means they're ignorant of his word. How do I know that? Well, let's go to one more verse. In Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 5, and we're going to look in verse uh, 13, Paul says, I believe Paul will be the writer here, he says, for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. Now, friends, if someone has a zeal for God but not according to righteousness, that means they don't know the word. 
And so the reason why there's so much different, so many differences in religion, why Sunday is the most segregated day of the week, is because people do not want to submit to the righteousness of God. They don't want to submit to the authority. They don't want to submit to the, the, the power of God's word, if you will. And so they're fighting the power. You know, they're you say, Well, I you know, I would never be out in the street and writing and like this uh, uh, Antifa, I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, Antifa or uh, Black Lives Matters or the neo Nazis. I would never be out there protesting and, and doing all these things like they do. They're they're uh, uh, anarchists. You know, they're just promoting uh, hatred and violence and things like that. I would never do that. Well, you might not do that, but still, you are still rebelling against God's authority. So, to what degree is rebellion against God okay? That's the question that we have to answer, friends. That's what we have to look at. So, when we're talking about authority, uh, finding authority is what we need to do. How do we understand the Bible? How do we come to use the Bible as God's standard for authority? And that's what we're going to be discussing uh, today. Now, I do want to give you the phone numbers. This is going to be something new for me because I'm not used to having to say phone numbers. I'm used to people having, having to being able to see the phone numbers. So, uh, I'm going to try to remember to say these from time to time, but if you want to join the discussion, um, we'll open the phone lines up, 336-627-WLOE, uh, or 336 427 wmyn and I meant to write that actual numbers down, and uh, so you can see that. I believe that's 336-427-9696, um, I believe is, is uh, right. And also, 336-627-9563. Uh, and so if you want to call in and, and join the discussion, we've got to do that. But let's go on. So what is authority? Now, if we don't find authority, friends, there's not going to be any religious question that can be settled. I mean, we're talking about differences in, in religious beliefs, their doctrines, practices. Uh, we really can't answer that satisfactorily if we do not agree on what is the authority. So if you're calling on this program, I hope that we can start by simply saying that we can all at least start with the idea of the Bible is going to be our answer. The Bible is going to be our guide. It's going to be our source of authority. And so if that's the case, if that's the case, then we'll be able to make some headway. I'm confident. If that's where people believe, if they believe the Bible is the Word of God and they believe that the Bible is the source of authority, then uh, we're going to have some good dialogue and we're going to be making some headway to achieving the unity that Christ prayed for. Now, you know, if you ask someone by what authority they do, they do something, uh, that's a legitimate question. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 21, in verse 20, 23, Individuals ask Jesus about his authority. Now listen to what it says. Matthew 21, verse 23. And I hope you have your Bibles uh, and you're following along with your Bibles or your pen and your paper so you can jot these verses down as we go through them. If you have any question about something we've said, call in and ask a question. Or you can call me afterwards if you'd like to. I'd be glad to hear from you. But Matthew 21, and verse 23. Here we go. And when he was coming to the temple... The chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things, and who gave thee this authority? Now, someone might say, Well, James, you know, we're supposed to be like Jesus, and Jesus wouldn't argue the Scripture. Jesus wouldn't, uh, uh, he wouldn't debate the Scripture. Well, you know, you need to read more about Jesus if you really think that. And you say you might be saying, well, see, the Pharisees, they're the ones that are the, the, excuse me, the chief priests and the elders, they're the ones that asked Jesus the authority question. Jesus didn't ask things like that. Well, have you read the next verse? Because the next verse, Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. And then he said, the baptism of John, whence, whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reason with themselves, saying, if we, shall, if we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did you not then believe him? And if we say of men, we fear the people, for, be, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. 
So friends, Jesus asked questions about people's authority or where they got the authority to do what they did or why they were doing things. And so it's a legitimate thing for us to ask the same question, by what authority are you doing what you do in religion? Now friends, you can call in and you can ask me about what authority I do things and I'll give you Bible authority. That's why this program's called A Word from the Lord because the word, A Word from the Lord, the Bible, is the Word of God and it is about what we use, it is what we use to get our authority. So when you're talking about authority, maybe we need to define what authority really is. I mean, that's kind of a, a term that people don't use anymore. They should. I asked a pastor down in Greensboro one time, I asked him about what authority did he, uh, I believe it was have instrumental music, and he looked at me like, what are you talking about? Like he'd seen a, you know alien. And he said, you're talking above my head. What do you mean authority? And I just couldn't believe that someone wouldn't, didn't have the concept of doing something with authority. Uh, you know, and so what is authority then? Well, you know, the Bible uses the word authority, and it's, and it's defined or used in different ways, just like we have words that are defined in different ways. So let's go to the Bible and let's see how this word authority is really defined. Um, in Luke 23, verse 7, for example, the word authority, the word translated authority, is used to indicate jurisdiction. Now, listen to what the Bible says. And as soon as he knew, now this is talking about Pilate, as soon as Pilate knew that Jesus belonged into Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. So uh, the word authority here is translated jurisdiction. Now you can understand that. A person has authority in a certain realm. You know, the county sheriff uh, has authority in his jurisdiction. That's the county. But once Sam Page gets out of Rockingham County, he doesn't have authority. It's no longer in his jurisdiction. Now it goes to the state and so forth. We understand that. So we understand that authority is, re is relegated by, by a, a jurisdiction. Another way is the idea of power or the ability to exercise uh, something, to, to give orders. For example, in John 19 and verse 10, Then saith Pilate unto Jesus, Speak that speakest thou not unto me, knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? So Pilate had within his uh, means to give the sentence of crucify Jesus or let him go. And so there we have a, a one way that authority is used. Pilate could give that authority, and we know he actually exercised that later on. Uh, authority can be used in the idea of giving someone orders. In other words, to delegate uh, to a subordinate. In Luke 7 and verse 8, the centurion that came to Jesus, and uh, he said, I'm a man also under, set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say to one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. So the idea of, of authority is a person in authority. Or it's the right to do a thing. Now this is, this is something that we are seeing a lot in our society. Individuals want to exercise their rights. We love our rights. And I'm, I'm not putting down rights. I love rights. I appreciate uh, the rights we had, the Bill, of, uh, the Bill of Rights, you know, the freedom uh, of expression, the freedom of speech. I mean, I'm glad, you know, that we can... I'm sitting here on the radio. I'm sitting here talking to you over the radio. And it's a freedom of speech. And uh, and so I'm, I'm glad that the... The, the country we live in affords us this right. And that's what we're talking about here in, in uh, Hebrews 13, verse 11. Here's the way the word's used. Uh, he says, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve of the tabernacle. And he's, of course, he's talking about the fact that uh, some individuals who operate in the temple, they got some of the sacrifices. But uh, we have an altar, the altar we're, we're partaking of now, the spiritual altar, and they don't have the right to eat which serve in the tabernacle. So there's no uh, reason you don't get to exercise it. You don't get to exercise the privileges of that. Now, friends, if we're talking about authority, we have to recognize the Bible limits authority. Some people, some people don't get to do whatever they want to do. And that's why, that's the same reason why people are rioting in the streets and why they're burning flags and destroying property is because they, they want the right to do what they want to do, and the, and the religion is no different. People do the same thing. 
they don't want to submit to authority, and so they say, I'm going to exercise my right and do what I want to. Well, you can do what you want to. You can do what you want to, but you need to understand, you need to understand that uh, there is a power, there's an authority above you that one day is going to hold you accountable for whatever you do. And so, and this is what we're talking about now. Listen to this. In Deuteronomy 18, verses 17 to 22, this is where we're... Uh, uh, where I'm coming from. This is what I want you to understand, friends. When we're talking about Bible authority, we're talking about doing things that God has spoken or given commands for. Now, God always spoke or gave commands, and it was done in the name of the Lord. That is, by His authority. In Deuteronomy 18, verses 17 through 22, uh, God told Moses that He was going to raise up a prophet one day he was going to raise up a prophet, and here's what he says. They will have spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I command him, all that I shall command him. Now listen to what he said. I will put words in his mouth. I will put my words in his mouth. So if someone is speaking for God, they're speaking the words that God has given him. Now that's authority. If you have the authority to speak for someone else, then you are basically their mouthpiece. And that's what God's saying. I'll put my words in, in, in this prophet's mouth. And he says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, what's going to happen to him? Or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. Now, consider that, friends. If someone was speaking on behalf of God and God didn't tell him to speak, he's going to be in trouble. God is going to hold him accountable. He's actually going to die because he's speaking presumptuously. He's speaking presumptuously. That is, he is not speaking the thing that God says. As a matter of fact, in uh, the, the next verse he says, when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath, hath not spoken, but that prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Now, friends, if I hear someone saying, well, I have Bible authority, or I'm, I'm following the Bible, then I am going to ask them, well, show me the authority. Show me where in the Bible you have the authority to do such and such thing. And then, if you can show me in the Bible... Friends, that's exactly, that's exactly what uh, uh, I want. I want Bible authority for why you do what you do. And if you can't show me Bible authority, then you know what I'm going to say? I'm going to say, God hadn't spoken by you. You are not speaking by the authority of God or in the name of God because you're not saying what the Bible says. I believe the Bible is the Word of God. Now, if you do too, we're on the same page there. But if you say you believe the Bible is the Word of God and then you start telling me something that's different from the Bible, then we're going to have differences, okay? All right, 336-627-WLOE or 636-427-WMYN. All right, so let's, let's continue on here. Now, we're talking about Bible authority. Now, friends, here's something that you can tell about someone speaking on God's behalf. God's spokesman never spoke as their own authority. You think about that. They never spoke on their own behalf. They always spoke with a thus saith the Lord. It was always uh, demonstrated, or it was, it was, uh, um, yeah, it was demonstrated that what they were saying was indeed from God. In 1 Corinthians 2, verses 4 through 5, listen to this. Paul said, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, friends, if, if you're speaking, or if someone says they're speaking for God or on God's behalf, how are you going to know? Now, Paul said that his speech was not with man's wisdom, but with demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Now think with me for a moment. In the first century, they didn't have the New Testament. They didn't have the, the written New Testament like you and I have. We don't, they didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all through Revelation. They didn't have that. It was being written at the time. 
So they couldn't go to the New Testament to verify if something was indeed true or not. So how would you, how would you know if someone came along and said, well, thus said the Lord? How would you know if he was telling you the truth? Well, the way you would know is he would demonstrate. He would do something that only God could do. He would demonstrate by, by proving what he was saying was from God, <clears throat> excuse me, by doing something that only uh, a person with God could do. Now listen, in Acts 2 and verse 22, Acts 2 and verse 22, Peter and the other eleven are preaching on the day of Pentecost, and here's what they say. He said, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Christ was approved by God. He was given a stamp of approval by the things that he did. Now, Jesus actually said that in John 5. Uh, he said the works that he did, those were proof that, that he was from God. Uh, Nicodemus said on another occasion in John chapter 3 and verse 5, uh, there was a, Pharisee, a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a root of the Jews, the same came to Jesus by night, and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So it was, understand, it was understood that if someone was doing something that only God could do, then their message had to be from God. Well, today, friends, here is how we uh, find that authority. Here's how we find that authority. We go to the Bible. We go to what we know is God's Word, and we say, all right, if a man is speaking with God's approval, then he's going to be giving me something right from the Bible. Now, friends, you need to think carefully about this because there's a lot of individuals who are sitting in the pews on Sunday, Wednesday, Thursday, Tuesday, whenever you have Bible study, Sunday, uh, Tuesday, uh, Wednesday morning ladies class or whatever, and they're sitting there and they're going, oh, I'm getting God's word, I'm getting God's authority because my preacher has a Bible. Well, friends, just because your preacher has a Bible doesn't mean that he's telling you exactly what the Bible says. It doesn't mean that he's, he's accurately telling you what the authority says. And the reason I know that is because doctrines and practices and things like that that are contrary to God's word are still being taught. So here's what we're saying. Ask your preacher, your pastor, your bishop, rabbi, whoever it may be, just ask him for Bible authority. Ask him, why do we believe this? Or why do you teach this? And I'm going to say chances are he's not going to answer. He's not going to give you a Bible answer. And chances are he's probably going to tell you, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. That's not important. He'll give you some, he'll blow off answer. But he won't show you the scriptures. Now, how do I know that? Because, friends, we've talked to a number of preachers about things like the sinner's prayer and, th and things like that, born in sin. And you know what? The preachers won't answer. The preachers won't answer. I mean, there's a preacher in, in uh, Eden, and I'm going to say his name. I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm just telling you. There's, there's a, a preacher in Eden named Benny Wood, and I've asked him a couple of times about uh, things like the sinner's prayer, and he said, I'm not going to answer. Can't answer, won't answer. My friends, I have a problem with that. Here's somebody that claims to be telling people from God's word what they're saying. And I'm saying if the doctor told you that, if you went to the doctor and asked him, doctor, what's wrong with me? And he said, well, I'm not really going to tell you. I'm not really going to tell you what the, uh, the technician said about your x-rays. I'm not really going to tell you what the blood work came back to say. I'm, you know, I'm just not going to tell you. Well, I'd be finding me another doctor. And if my doctor <clears throat> wouldn't sit down with another doctor to discuss a certain diagnosis, I can tell you one thing, I'm finding me another doctor. Because I want someone who's going to give me, with authority, the truth. Now, friends, that's where we are in religion. And so God's spokesmen always spoke with God's authority. They didn't make stuff up on their own. They didn't go off on a limb. They didn't give their own message. Now, friends, just to show you how uh, consistent this is, did you ever stop to think that even the Holy Spirit didn't go off on a limb? The Holy Spirit didn't talk on his own. You say, well, James, the, the, the Bible is the Spirit's word. Well, that's right. The Spirit guided them into all truth. But I'm saying the Spirit didn't add something on his own. Now, the Spirit is deity. The Spirit is God. I mean, he's deity, just like Christ is deity, and just like the Father's deity. I believe the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But just as Jesus submitted to the Father, the Holy Spirit 
submitted to his role in bringing about revelation. Now listen carefully. In John 16, verses 13 through 14. How be it, Jesus said, How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. Now, friends, the Holy Spirit didn't make up part of the revelation. He simply revealed or related what was given to him to relate. Now, friends, when I hear a man or a woman or whoever it may be, that's giving me, holding up the Bible and saying, here's what the Bible says, and then they add to it, they add a little something to it, or they add something that's going to contradict what the Bible says in another place, they're doing something even the Holy Spirit wouldn't do. They're doing something that, that the Holy Spirit didn't do. They, they're adding something to the message. Now, you want to wonder why we don't have div uh, uh, unity in religion, why we are so divided, why we're so uh, different, in our beliefs on Sunday morning or whenever it is, it's because people don't want to submit to the authority of God. They don't want to submit to the Bible. They're content to add to it, to do things that, that uh, even the Holy Spirit who inspired men to give the book wouldn't even do. My friends, I'm, I submit to you that is, that's the problem that we're having in unity, in, in Christianity, so-called Christianity. That's why we don't have the unity we desire. It's because we don't uh, as a whole, people don't submit to the authority of Christ. Okay, if you want to call in, 336-627-WLOE, 336-427-WMYN. I'm going to get these numbers down, uh, and I'm gonna, I'll remember them a little bit better. That's 336-427-9696 or 336-627-9563. Call in with your uh, question on authority or any Bible question. We'll open it up, kind of an open line sort of thing, get going here. All right, so, friends, why are we divided? It's because people don't understand authority. Now, let's think about this for a moment. One of the problems that I submit to you that people have is they get unauthorized authority. Now, would, what would you think about someone in your house? You come home, someone's in your house, and you say, what are you doing here? Well, so-and-so said I come in. Your neighbor said I could come in. Your neighbor doesn't have authority to tell someone to come in your house. If I came home and somebody was in my house, and I said, what are you doing here? And they said, well, you know, your neighbor said I could come in. Well, they don't have the authority. Who told you that you could do this? Well, friends, we're saying the same thing about religion. You know, a lot of people, I believe, they say they use the Bible as authority. They say they're using the Bible as authority, but what they really do is they're trusting someone else to give them Bible authority. Now friends, I don't know about you, but I, I don't want to trust my soul to someone who's telling me what the Bible says and me not check it out. I'm not asking you to take my word for anything I say. That's why I'm telling you, get your Bible out, your pens and paper out, and let's uh, have a discussion about what the Bible's saying because I don't want you to take my word for anything. I want you to check it out. I want you to examine the Bible. I want you to say, well, here's what James said on, on the radio. James is selling, telling me such and such. Well, let's check it out. All right? Don't take my word for it. But a lot of people, they'll trust a the preacher. They'll trust a the preacher. I've, I've heard people uh, ask a question about something in the Bible, and they say, well, my preacher can find it. Well, friend, is your preacher going to stand before, before God on the judgment day? Is he going to stand beside you? I don't think he is. I know he's not. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 that we're going to be standing on the judgment seat, uh, standing before the judgment seat by ourselves. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in their body according to, the, to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, friends, you may want your preacher to stand beside you to give you account of why he said what he's going to do, but I wouldn't want to be standing by your preacher. I would not want to be standing by him because the Bible says in James, in James chapter 3, my brethren, be not many masters, don't be many teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. The preachers, the teachers, the ones that are telling you what the Bible is saying and telling you it's okay to do certain things, 
that are not authorized in the Bible, they're going to be the ones that are going to receive a greater condemnation. I sure don't want to be standing by them. I would want to be standing beside the New Testament writers. I, don't want, I want to be standing by Paul and Peter. James and John, I want to be standing by them because I'm going to be following their words. And if God says, well, James, you didn't do this, I want, to be, I want to be able to say, well, here's what the Bible says. Now, I know that's not going to be a case. I'm not going to be giving any kind of answer uh, when I stand before the judgment seat. My faith's going to be sealed. But I'm just saying uh, by way of example, you know, if I'm going to be standing before the judgment seat of Christ, I want to know now if what I'm doing, what I'm teaching, what I'm believing is in the Bible. So I'm asking you, do that Do that very thing. You know, uh, let's, uh, let's open up the Bible and let's see what, uh, uh, what it has to say. Now, let me ask you this. What do you think, if I said to you, if I said to you, Billy Graham is not a good authority? What would you think about that? Call me. 336-627-WLOE, uh, 336-427-9696. Call me tell me what you think about that. Billy Graham, this is Billy Graham's stomping grounds right here. <clears throat> We're right here in his back door. Now, what would you think about that? Now, I, I'm not trying to say that to make people mad. I want you to consider something. Because I'm going to tell you, friends, Billy Graham, if he's your authority, he's leading a lot of people astray. Now, I'm not going to say that and just let it hang there, I'm going to give you an example. Would you believe <clears throat> that Billy Graham, <clears throat> excuse me, would you believe that Billy Graham says that a person doesn't even need to know the name of Jesus to be saved? Now friends, if that's the man I'm trusting in, you need to consider who you follow. You need to consider who's being taught. Listen to what he says. I'm going to play this video for you, and I want you to consider if what I'm telling you is the truth, all right? All right, we got a phone call coming in, and uh, this is going to start playing right in the middle of that. I'm going to take this call. Uh, let me stop this from playing, and we'll get to this phone call, okay? You're on the work from the Lord. Caller, you're on the work from the Lord. All right. I'm, you there, caller? Hello? You're on the air. All right, I'm going to let you go. Uh, if you're listening, call back. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I may not be having something right on this uh, phone in here, but I think that's right. I could hear him. Listen to, what, listen to what Billy Graham says about salvation. And I'm going to tell you, friends, if you haven't heard this before, it's very, very shocking. It's very, very telling. It's very, very telling because he's asked a question. I believe this is Robert uh, Schuler or Schumer Schuler, who's asking him this question, and uh, he's going to tell them about God's God's grace or His uh, mercy. And so, listen to what they have to say here. What do you think is the future of Christianity? I think everybody that, that loves Christ or knows Christ, whether they're conscious of it or not, they're members of the body of Christ. And that's what God is doing today. He's calling people for, out of the, the, the world for his name, whether they come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the Christian world or the non-believing world. Uh, they are members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but uh, they know in their heart that they need something that they don't have, and they turn to the only light that they have, and I think that they are saved, and that they're going to be with us in heaven. All right, now friends, that's, to me, I, I mean, that's unbelievable. All right, we got the caller back, I think, or we have another caller. You're on the word of the Lord. Can you hear me? You're on the air. You're on the air. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you spoke a minute ago uh, about the sinner's prayer. Uh, what were you trying to say? What authority do you have to uh, condemn the sinner's prayer? 
there's a lot of people there's a lot of people out here that that, uh, that believe it that, that teach it that, that hold fast to it and uh, I just wanted you to clear that up a little on what you what you uh, what you meant by uh, okay mentioned it earlier all right all right that's a good can can you hear me now are we are we, are we talking to each other right now can you can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. I'm trying to figure out this phone system. Okay, that's a good question about the uh, uh, the sinner's prayer. Let's <clears throat> let's just look at what the Bible says. Let's go to the scriptures. That's going to be our our authority. Do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? I mean, is that the inspired Word of God that we should use? Are we on the same page on that? The King James Bible. Okay, all right. So let's talk about the sinner's prayer then. Now, when I say the sinner's prayer, I'm talking about an alien sinner. Do you understand what I mean by an alien sinner? Someone that has never accepted Jesus? Right, right. I'm talking about someone who's outside the body of Christ. In other words, you have individuals that are uh, that are in a covenant relationship with God. All right, they're actually they're actually in Christ, but we're talking about uh, an alien sinner. And uh, that's that's what we're talking about here. I'm going to try to get a scripture here that we can uh, use to at least show this. In Ephesians 2, in verse 11, this is what I'm talking about. Paul said, Wherefore, remember that ye being, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. So, when we're saying alien sinners, we're talking about those who are outside of a covenant relationship with God. So, not a not a sinner. Let let's say that uh, backslides, who's already in a relationship with God, but an alien sinner. So we're we're on the same page so far, right? Yes. All right. Now, when I say that. When I say no sinner's prayer, there's no place in the Bible. So I can't, I cannot find Bible authority for any place when a, where an alien sinner simply prayed and had his sins forgiven. Now, one one of the places that that people uh, like to go is they like to uh, go to a place where. Uh, we read about a man that goes into the temple. Now, in Luke 18, Jesus gave a parable. And I'm going to show you why this cannot be the sinner's prayer. And this may be something that maybe your, your pastor or whatever has told you before. Maybe you've heard it before. But in Luke 18, verse 9, Jesus spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to a temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a publican. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God... I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess, and the publican standing afar off would not so much would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me a sinner. I tell you this man uh went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now this man was not an alien sinner. He called himself a sinner. And the Bible says after he prayed, he went. To, he was justified. But he was already in a covenant relationship with God. He was in the temple. Now, no, nobody that was outside of a covenant with God could go into the temple. A Gentile couldn't go in. They'd be killed. And so this man was already in a relationship with God. So this is not the sinner's prayer. And uh, furthermore... Uh, at this time, Jesus hadn't even shed his blood. So how do you pray for the blood of Christ to cleanse you of your sins when Jesus hadn't even died yet? Uh, so how are we doing so far? Well, I'm trying to follow you, but what do you, what do you say to them that one of us do to, to, to put himself in a covenant relationship with God? Okay, all right, that's a good question. Well, uh, let me give you one more before I answer that. John, uh, John 9, John 9 and verse 31, um, the Bible says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. 
So God's not hearing a sinner, and the reason we know that is because uh, sin separates you from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, God's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So why would God want to forgive you of your sins through prayer when you haven't obeyed him on anything else? So what God says now, here's the authority for what a person must do to be saved, is this. In Acts chapter 15 and verse 7, uh, Peter says, Men and brethren, you know how that God, a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So in order to be saved, here's the steps you have to take. Number one, you have to hear the gospel. Obviously you have to hear the truth. And then you have to believe it. Now, some people would stop right there. You heard a faith only caller? All right. Now, I don't know how you feel about faith only, but faith only is dead. James says faith, faith without works is dead. So a working faith is what's needed here. So you must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. All right. You have to believe the gospel. And then you have to, the Bible says, repent of your sins. Acts 17 and verse 30. Acts 17 and verse 30. Paul said, God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Now, that doesn't stop there. You're still not in a covenant relationship with God if you just repent. You believe and you repent. That, that still hasn't gotten you there. The Bible says, let me give you one that you're probably familiar with, uh, Romans 10. Are you familiar with Romans 10, verses 9 yes, and 10? Confession. Yeah. God, thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in that heart that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart men believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So there's confession that has to be made with the mouth. So you're confessing Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, you're confessing your belief in Christ. Now that's Acts chapter 8. Now I know I'm going, I'm going kind of fast here. I'm, I'm running up against the clock too, but I want to... Uh, get this out. So if you're writing this down, folks, this is Acts, I went to Acts 17, Acts 15, 7. Then we went to uh, Acts 17, 30. You hear, hear the gospel, believe it, you repent of your sins. And then we went to Romans 10, 9 and 10, where you have to confess with your mouth. And this is what you confess. John 8, I mean Acts 8 and verse 37. Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he made the confession that he believed Jesus is the Son of God. Now, this next step, this next point about salvation is what everybody gets a hang up on. But I'm going to call her, I'm going to give you Bible authority for this, okay? Uh, and we've already said we agree that the Bible is going to be our authority. So, Acts chapter, Acts chapter 22 and verse 16 Saul of Tarsus was told by a gospel preacher, Why tearest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now here's where baptism comes in. Notice, it comes in before your sins are washed away, or your sins are washed away in baptism. Now I know that's a lot, I know that may be a hard pill to swallow. Uh, have, you, you, have you heard differently than that? Ephesians 2.8, I mean, uh, how, how does that not make a work salvation? Uh, well, okay. Uh, well, here's the thing about a work salvation, Ephesians 2.8. Uh, it's where by grace are you saved through faith and not, not of yourself, just get to God. Uh, well, well, faith itself is a work. And as we said a, a minute ago too, in James chapter 2, uh, Faith without works is dead. So uh, I find it interesting that people want to say faith only, but they they don't want to say works. Because when you say faith only, you have to have works. By definition, if faith is going to save you, it's going to have some works uh, along with it. In James 2, verse 
uh, 18, or verse 17, James 2, 17, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So, uh, you know, faith faith is always does something. So even if you're saved by faith, saved by grace through faith, uh, faith is going to cause you to do something. Well, what are you going to do? Well, what you're going to be doing is what God says to do in order to be saved. How about, how about uh, believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Because belief is a work. And then you have to repent of your sins. You confess Christ before man. Now, these are not works that you devise. It's not works that I devise. We didn't make this up. But they are works that God says has to be done. In order to obtain what God is offering. Now, caller, if I if I were to ask you, have you ever, I don't know, uh, won a door prize or somebody's going to give you something away? You've heard somebody that was going to be given something, and then you have to meet the requirements to receive that gift. You know, let's say if, if I get stuff in the mail all the time, car dealerships giving away a car key. You know, here's a car key. Come crank this car. Well, I can assure you if I go crank that car, there's going to be something more to it than me cranking that car and driving off. I'm probably going to have to sign some paperwork and probably pay some taxes on it. So it's not free just because I uh, go through that. There's some other things that are required. But even though I do those things that are required, it still, you know, you still can be saying it was a gift. And so faith... Uh, is something that we do. And salvation is something that requires some effort on our part. Uh, but it's not just saying a little prayer. And as a matter of fact, I don't know if you've seen these tracts. I mean, they're all different, I guess. But most of the little tracts that say, say a sinner's prayer, what they usually have on them is uh, pray to Jesus. Do they not? I think so. Yeah. And so Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, He's teaching his disciples to pray, and he said, Pray after this manner, our Father which art in heaven. So from the very from the very get-go, the sinner's prayer is not even addressing the right person. You know, you don't address Jesus to come into your heart and save you. Even if the sinner's prayer was right, the sinner's prayer is still wrong. So um, I don't know if that if we're making any headway on that. Uh, but I'm I'm running I've got I've got about three minutes left, caller. So how are we doing? Uh I've got a lot to look at. Okay, all right. Well, I appreciate your call. Tell tell all your your neighbors about the the program that comes on Sunday night, uh, Sunday afternoon at five p.m. here on uh, WLOE and Rockingham County Radio. That might be a easy way.